we're talking about hydrodynamic description of transport and strongly correlated electron systems. So very much looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, so I want to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to be here. It's really enjoyable scientifically and personally. Um, so I uh, prepared for you four stories. Uh, let me see why it doesn't click. Okay. Four stories. Um, so I'll talk about uh, resistivity and strongly correlated to DEX. Uh, Thermolytic anomaly in whole bar devices, uh, same physics, but in Carvina devices with some aerodynamic paradoxes. Uh, and uh, time permitting, I also would like to say a few words about most recent result on uh, uh, drug anomaly um, as observed in electronic double layers and graphene systems and the possible resolution of very puzzling observing features through near field, uh, near field heat transfer. Uh, and I also prepared a little homework for you to enjoy, which uh, I think you may like. Um, all right, so part one, um, so we usually ascribe RS uh, as a, a quantifying parameter for the strength of electronic interactions, which is just the ratio of coulomb to kinetic energy in two dimensions. It scales inversely proportional to the square root of particle density. So in dilute systems, RS, RS can be large. Uh, we know from numerics that somewhere around RS45 uh, electrons uh, are expected to crystallize and form with new crystal. Uh, lattice, and yet it leaves us with a very broad range of RS parameters, larger than one and smaller than this critical value when system is uh, in liquid state and yet very strongly correlated. Uh, so in, in experiments, this RS can be anywhere between, I don't know, 10 to 38. Uh, some other uh, prominent features that we will explore in our computations is that the systems have very small Fermi energies, uh, electron phonon scattering is typically uh, really weak, uh, and uh, the systems are subjected to the a smooth long range disorder potential. And I will explore this quite extensively in this talk. Um, so, sort of an experimental uh, inspiration comes from this review article by uh, Boris Pivak, uh, Sergei Kravchenko, uh, Steve Kilvilson, and Juan Gao who observed uh, and reviewed a large volume of experiments. And so I'll focus just on the resistances. They found that in very different systems, ranging from silicon germanium to silicon mass fats and gallium arsenide quantum wells, resistivity remarkably behaves very similarly. So all, what unites all of the systems is that they are all in very large RS values, again, somewhere from 10 to 35. Uh, so uh, these three plots I took for the review, this one I just took from the uh, Pablo's uh, experiment in twisted bilayer graphene, and uh, amusingly, it shows a very similar trend. Uh, so first part of the story is try to perhaps understand it. Uh, one feature that I'd like to notice here is that resistance goes down with an increase of temperature. And uh, if you think about this, this is sort of a little unusual. We typically think that if we increase the temperature, we increase the probability for electron to be scattered by something, by phonon, by impurity, or, or any other available excitation. So the fact that resistance drops requires an explanation. And historically speaking, we do have at least one candidate scenario how this could happen. And so I prepared one slide as a reminder, and then we'll sort of elaborate on top of it. So back in the early days, uh, Radi Gurji um, thought about the electronic hydrodynamic behavior. So he was interested to consider a regime when electron-electron mean three passes, the shortest length scale in the problem. Shorter than any momentum or energy relaxing mean three pass due to disorder, uh, phonons, and so on. So he, in this case, there are very frequent efficient electron-electron collisions. Electron fluid thermalizes at the short uh, and fast uh, short length scales, fast time scales. And so he was interested in then exploring the transport at larger scale. So he started with kinetic equation uh, and considered uh, aerodynamic flow of this fluid. And from kinetic theory, he derived an effective equation of motion for aerodynamic velocity. Uh, and not, perhaps not surprisingly, he got just the uh, Newton's law that tells us that the force that exerted in the liquid that we're trying to push is balanced by the viscous stresses and also bulk friction as he was also still considering bulk disorder. And so then complemented by the uh, equation for the current. So this um, uh, Newton's law gives us uh, a new length scale in the problem. If we compare, so new here is the kinematic viscosity, which is shear viscosity divided by the mass density. And so 
Uh, if we compare these two terms and recall that the Laplacian has units inverse length squared, uh, so then the comparison of these two terms give us a length scale, which can be expressed as a geometrical mean between the electron electron mean free path and electron uh, relaxing mean free path. So LEE sits in viscosity. So then if we would consider the flow in a restricted geometry, situation is different whether the, let's say in 2D case, whether the width of the channel is bigger than this Gurji lens or smaller than it. So if the width of the channel is big, bigger than the Gurji lens, uh, viscous stresses are not important. We are dominated by the bulk friction. So then U uh, from here is just proportional to relaxation time and we get just to do the conductivity from here. But in the opposite case, uh, we can ignore the bulk friction. Uh, momentum relaxation occurs at the boundaries of the sample. And so we need to solve the Navier-Stokes equation, uh, which would give us parabolic profile of the flow. We recalculate the current and get that effective conductivity scales quadratically with the channel and inversely proportional to the uh, viscosity of the fluid. In other words, resistance would be proportional to viscosity. And in Fermi liquids, uh, viscosity is inversely proportional to square of temperature. So once we increase temperature, viscosity drops, and that should lead to a drop in resistance. So that is sort of the manifestation of the Gurji effect. All right. Uh, so I believe, I'm not 100% confident, but it appears to me that the first experiment that contained words hydrodynamic and electron flow together was from Lawrence Mullen Cup in 90. So it took a really long time since the proposals by Gurji to see some of this uh, effects in, the, in materials. Uh, so first thing that I'd like to do is just sort of uh, generalize this idea of uh, Gurji effect to the case of the system subjected to the long range disorder potential. And I will follow the footsteps of Anton, Steve and Boris. And I'll guide you through a series of arguments that are very simple. Uh, usually when we calculate transport, um, uh, we have two options. We can calculate either linear response and establish uh, proportionality coefficients between the currents and driving forces, or we can compute dissipative power and then equate it to the joule heat and extract resistance this way. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, use both uh, methods interchangeably, and sometimes it's easier to do it one way uh, or the other. All right, so imagine, so uh, for simplicity of it, I will consider a flowing 1D channel, again, with this long range disorder potential. Generalization to 2D uh, requires a little more work, but conceptually exactly the same. I will tell you what the changes would be. So suppose that we have electrons, a very short mean free pass, uh, this wiggles of the disorder potential much bigger than the electron electron mean three path. So let's uh, see what happens. Uh, assuming uh, that we are in hydrodynamic regime, so we need to solve continuity equation, Navier Stokes equation, and equation for the heat flux. Uh, so the continuity equation will tell us that the product of particle density and hydrodynamic velocity is constant. Each of these quantities individually is coordinate dependent. We are dealing with an homogeneous system, but the continuity fixes their product. Now, uh, uh, the stress tensor in uh, 1D contains only bulk component. There is no shear in 1D. So it means that the stress tensor is just a bulk viscosity divergence of the current. So in this case, it means that uh, stress tensor is bulk viscosity current and derivative of the inverse density. And dissipative power, uh, copy pasted from Landau Lifshitz volume six, is just the product of the stress and the components of the velocity. Uh, it will give us yet another derivative from the velocity field. So we'll get current density squared, viscosity, and specially averaged uh, derivative of the inverse density squared. So this would immediately, as you can see, give you something which is Gurji-like. So we'll have a result for resistance. If I look at the left-hand side of this formula, so J squared would cancel, and the viscous part of resistance is like in the Gurji effect. Uh, so then I need to repeat this uh, uh, argument also for the heat fluxes. There is additional contribution to the dissipative power. And then a similar line of arguments give you another term in this resistance formula that would uh, contain the entropy density per particle squared and also averaged over the system and scales inversely proportional to the thermal conductivity. So that is the formula. Uh, that uh, uh, describe resistance in two dimensions, you would have a factor of two in denominator, uh, and then you need to replace bulk viscosity by the sum of the shear and the bulk. Uh, 
So I'd like to make a couple of comments about this expression. So first of all, uh, from the standpoint of view of electron interactions, uh, this formula is non-perturbative. So all of the complications where interactions are sit in, in this kinetic coefficients that we don't formally don't know. I mean, we don't have really rel reliable tools to calculate them, but that is the power of the aerodynamics that assuming that some quantities are given to us, we can express something else in terms of them. So still, in order to extract some predictive uh, statements, I'd like to take uh, a pragmatic approach and sort of rely on experiments. And people in the past asked questions whether Fermi liquid predictions apply in the regime of large RS. And let's say from the work of Jim Eisenstein and others, they in particular from tunneling measured quantum lifetimes of particles in this strongly correlated fluids. And they say that at least in, temp in terms of the temperature dependencies, these lifetimes are consistent with the statements of the Fermi uh, liquid prediction. So let's take this uh, and try to make estimates based on that formula that I just showed it to you. So in Fermi liquids, we know that thermal conductivity uh, is the product of specific heat and mean three paths. So mean three pass by the usual uh, phase space argument is one over T square. Specific heat is linear in temperature. So thermal conductivity should scale inversely proportional to T. And again, in 2D at weak coupling, we can do better. Uh, there are some logs and et cetera, but I'm doing just, you know, just an estimate without any, uh, uh, any extra uh, logarithms. Uh, so the viscosity uh, by similar arguments is inversely proportional to the square uh, of temperature. Uh, so then we need also to do disorder average because uh, uh, it, it's model specific. So I will assume that there is a doping layer somewhere at the distance D away from the plane of the two deck with uncorrelated coolant impurity. So that would be one of the models that I hope is uh, experimentally relevant. So it will give us the uh, power of the noise from the uncorrelated dopants and that would enable us to do disorder averaging. So then, uh, so if I go back, uh, so in, uh, as we just discussed, um, so this uh, linear in T uh, kappa is one over T and entropy is linear in T. So this term would be T to the four uh, and viscosity is one over T square. Uh, but these terms would also have different density dependence upon average. So this is what you would get. Uh, applicability of the hieronymic picture uh, in our case assumes that mean three pass is shorter than D, meaning this distance to the gate, it plays the role of the correlation radius of the disorder potential, it gives us an upper bound threshold in temperature for the applicability of hieronymic picture, it should be greater than the E Fermi divided by the square root of K Fermi D, and experiments for typical densities, this parameter is let's say somewhere in the range from being 4 to 16 or so on, yes. Uh, not necessary. I will come back to that. So it not, not uh, in finite. Um, uh, so here I'm just consider the bulk uh, bulk transfer. So there are no and I don't consider uh, point like disorder. So it's all smooth uh, flow on the profile of the large scale homogeneities. And so the only condition here I need is just to ensure that the mean free pass is shorter than the length scale of the disorder potential. So roughly speaking, is that scale? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I will elaborate on this a bit more late, late, later on. Yes, so basically what I'm trying to tell you here is that the competition of these terms gives this non-monotonic behavior. So first, resistance goes down. Uh, in this model case, not too uh, dramatically, but it does go down. It's dominated by the viscous contribution. Then it goes up, uh, which is dominated by the thermal conductivity. So I hope to give sort of a plausible argument that this non-monotonic trend is actually a property of the transport property of electronic fluid. Yeah, again, we need to ensure that the electron, electron, uh, so the, uh, repeat the question for the audience uh, in Zoom, the question was, why do I need this condition on the mean three path or well, on, on temperature? So this condition on temperature comes from the condition that electron, electron mean three path should be shorter than the length scale of, uh, of inhomogeneity. So I need to be in that regime of quick uh, equilibration. Uh, sorry. Yes. That's right. That's what I'm saying. It requires more work, but it goes, I will do 2D in 
few minutes essentially so we would split the flow in longitudinal transfer so it's more work but it comes yes Re remains with a modification of the factor of two and shear viscosity that needs to be added yeah of course he yes yes that's right it's a minimum ah yes excellent thank you thank you Andrei. thank you so uh in this plot i normalize temperature to this threshold of applicability of hydro picture so this is t1 uh so it starts from one so this t1 is e fermi or k fermi d now the minimum occurs at other scale which is e fermi cubic root of k fermi d so it is within where it's supposed to be furthermore i can roughly see by how much resistance drops assuming that i'm starting from somewhere from that peak and i compare two experiments and it's not that far for the density it's assuming that the model applies okay so it's not infinitely far away hopefully from reality all right so now uh graphene devices uh, so um sort of uh, again every story would start with experimental motivation uh, and this would be like a logical continuation of the previous story uh, so uh, this our experiment from the group of philip kim measuring thermal conductivity and uh, lorentz ratio in the uh, monolayer graphene close to the dirac point and so they observed uh, so the interest was to explore this uh, dirac fluid in, in graphene it's its properties and they discovered that uh, from the measurements of the thermal conductivity that uh, in the proper range of temperatures and this range of temperatures from this plot in the phase diagram you see starts from somewhere at 50 kelvin to somewhere like 100 kelvin they saw an enormously high effective thermal conductivity which also translates that the Lorentz ratio uh, normalized by the union, units of the Wiedemann Franz is also giant it's like a factor of 20. And so in the paper, they uh, in the abstract, they say that electron hole plasma in graphene near charge neutrality point forms a strongly correlated coupled fluid. And this effect is attributed to the decoupling of the charge and heat currents in the header in electron hydrodynamics. So uh, that's something for me to comment and explain and see how this uh, appears in the graphene devices. And uh, to tell you what what this decoupling is and why it happens uh, so they had also a follow-up study on the z-back effect again please notice that resistance again has a similar trend it goes down and goes up so hopefully it's sort of within the same picture uh, and they also comment that uh, uh, semi-classical mod formula doesn't work neither quantitatively nor qualitatively and so attempt was made to explain these results also based on the picture of electronic aerodynamics so let's start with something very simple I, again I will elaborate on this uh, calculation more and more so we need to generalize now things for graphene because electrons there are not Galilean invariant and so system and it brings a substantial modifications uh, is that the, we need to describe the transport in terms of the pristine uh, k, uh, kinetic coefficients and one of them uh, very important is so-called intrinsic conductivity uh, so York calculated uh, it for us along with some other people early on uh, it is of the order of uh, conductance quantum times some logs if we do weak coupling uh, so the current electrical current in graphene is given by the convective part the part that we already saw in the Gurji case but then it also contains the part what I will call in a relative mode meaning that at the fl stationary fluid uh, uh which is driven by electric field intrinsic conductivity and in principle thermoelectric coefficient uh and then the entropy current which is uh related by one power of temperature to the heat flux similarly convective part thermal conductivity and thermoelectric effect so now this decoupling uh that was mentioned in the abstract of Philip's work uh is seen at the level of currents let's say we go to charge neutrality and the charge neutrality convective part is out of the picture for the charge transport it's all everything is quenched by the relative mode and intrinsic conductivity yet in the heat flux convective part hydrodynamic flow dominates because it's governed by the entropy density not the particle density and effective thermal conductivity would be giant so let's see how this works out uh, suppose that we drive the system in x direction there is a whole bar width we need to solve our Navier-Stokes equation I here use just uh, uh vector units for n particle density entropy density this is my x density and capital x are conjugated forces electric field uh, temperature gradients 
solving navier stokes let's say simplicity for the no slip boundary conditions again gives parabolic profile we recalculate currents including this uh relative mode and this is what we would get uh, so resistance uh would have as a function so i would like to focus only at the regime near charge neutrality when the ratio of particle to entropy density is small in this regime viscosity is also known thanks to york he calculated again at recoupling module logs and etc it's t square uh intrinsic uh, thermoelectric coefficient is linear and temperature and linear and density so resistance has a lorentzian shape the width of this lorentzian is governed by the fluid velocity primarily in terms of temperature dependence as we discussed sigma uh, shows uh, very uh, little temperature dependence uh, so z back coefficient uh, and now thermal conductivity it has this form if you tailor uh, this formula to uh, charge neutrality this uh, term is gone so everything vanishes because it scales with density including gamma which is linear in density but this term survives it looks like a Gurdjieff formula but in this case just for the thermal conductance rather than for electrical conductance it scales as a square of the uh, width of the channel and inversely proportional to the fluid velocity so now if you work out the Lorentz ratio you would get roughly speaking the square uh, of the Lorentzian again with the same width that I told you and for reasonable numbers and reasonable densities you can get an enhancement by the factor of 25 or so uh, all right so now let's elaborate on this picture so graphene is of course not that perfect and I neglected everything in the first little calculation from STM uh, it's known that it's uh, has this uh, picture of electron hole puddles uh, the typical length scale of this electron hole puddles is at the scale of let's say 100 nanometers the scale of the potential fluctuations is about five milli electron volts so we need to do better than that we need to develop uh, Kivlis and Spivak like description for electron inhomogeneous system, but now generalized for electrons in graphene that are non Galilean invariant. So, this is what we did. Uh, so, the it's not a pleasant calculation, but the end result is sort of, I hope, intuitively clear. This disorder does several things it renormalizes effective coefficient, it leads to an effective friction coefficient. Uh, uh, which is governed by the local density and entropy density fluctuations uh, and described by entire matrix of thermoelectric coefficients so unlike in Gurji case the effective Gurji lens here would be very complex it would uh, in a complex fashion depends both on temperature and density uh, and then there is another peculiar effect uh, that is in this picture disorder actually enhances conductivity so there are hydrodynamic corrections to intrinsic conductivity which are governed by the fluid viscosity and let me try to give you an argument and hopefully in, in part it will answer the Leonid question as well uh, so when we consider um, inhomogeneous system which is charge neutral I'm talking about charge neutral globally in average locally we always have charges so when I drive the system I have a local force density which is proportional to the local density variations then there are a few things happen so the vectors into d I can split in longitudinal transversal directions and I need to solve uh, continuity equations into d and navier stokes equations together so this would give you both longitudinal components of the hydrodynamic flow and transversal now the potential part of the flow which is longitudinal in the force balance conditions is balanced by the pressure gradients that are developed in the fluid but the transversal flow the vertical component of the flow is only balanced by the stress tensor so risk of stresses and so this leads to a big enhancement so the flow in sort of other direction and then from the current uh, average uh, if you take this expression for the hydrodynamic velocity you get roughly an enhancement of the conductivity that square uh, that scales with the uh, low square of the density fluctuations and inversely proportional to the uh, viscosity of the fluid so we could do a uh, crossover uh, Gurji crossover and the bulk regime so we can recalculate this coefficients uh, so I should say that I was not the first one to work on this problem to explain Philip's experiments there are many papers before me and while we do agree on maybe big things there are some still differences in all of the theoretical approaches and uh, maybe it will be nice to have a chance someday to uh, get all together and discuss it with uh, with everybody okay. yes in this picture how would the optical conductivity look like uh, this I don't... 
Well, I don't know. I haven't looked at that, but I would guess yes. Um, something to be looked at. I don't know. Uh, all right. So theory to experiment very quickly. So this is from Philip. This is from us. And again, the, there are like honest goodness uh, estimates for densities and so on. So we've tried to uh, uh, match what we get to what has been measured. Uh, now, a couple of additional comments. Remember that Gurji formula in scaling with the square of the opening, there was another experiment from uh, uh, Manchester Group uh, creating uh, point contacts uh, in uh, graphene devices, these uh, whole bar devices, and they have measured uh, what is called the viscous conductance. Uh, by changing this opening of this uh, point, viscous point contact, uh, and it uh, seems to scale quadratically, suggesting uh, Poiselio's profile of the flow. Again, uh, resistivity as a function of temperature describes this deepening and upturn temperature dependence, and the extracted viscosity seems to fall really nicely to uh, uh, Fermi liquid. I should say that this experiment is done at high density, okay? So this is not the near neutrality experiment. Uh, so my colleague uh, at uh, UW Madison made the similar things, but he had a sort of uh, on-demand uh, des uh, designed obstacles for electronic flow, uh, the spin junctions, and also saw an enhancement of conductivity, uh, effective conductivity in the whole bar device that scales with the uh, opening of the channel. And just completely, so I'd like to say there are many, many experiments these days from imaging and so on, trying to see all of these features. Uh, this is sort of not an overview talk, but I wanted to give a credit to everyone who are trying to do imaging. I think it's quite powerful to uh, learn uh, quite a lot about the systems. All right, so let me see on my time. Uh, now I'd like to switch uh, to the next part about the, uh, so I'll discuss now the same uh, effect. Uh, I will change only a geometry. And quite remarkably, there are some uh, interesting puzzles appearing. So uh, when I was in Aspen, uh, uh, was a program on electron aerodynamics, and I've learned about this work from Grisha Falkovic and Andrei Shitov and Michal Shavit. Uh, so Grisha gave a colloquium uh, about this paper, which is called the freely flowing currents and electric field expansion in viscous electronics. So let me try to explain in my, my understanding what he did and what sort of paradoxical about the Carbina device. So uh, keep in mind the picture that we just had for whole bar, uh, whole bar geometry calculation, right? So what we did was said, all right, so first in order to calculate transport coefficient, we need to solve now your stocks with some boundary conditions. Once we have the flow profile, we can recalculate currents, and then we can reconstruct uh, the kinetic coefficients. Now, in the whole, in the Carbina geometry, when we inject, let's say, current in the, uh, in the inner electrode and collect it in the outer electrode, we have from the continuity equation of the current in the bulk of the flow, continuity tells us that the hydrodynamic velocity behaves as one over R. Okay, it's fixed. It just uh, fixed at the step number one. And it, it looks that we don't even need now your stocks in order to define the profile of the flow. Then you may ask yourself, all, all right, what then follows from the Navier Stokes uh, picture? Well, if you then look at the Navier Stokes equation, which has a Laplacian and a driving force, then let's take uh, hydrodynamic velocity, which is total current divided by two pi R E M, right? One over R and stick it in the radial component of Navier Stokes in here. And so this must be equal to electrical field that we apply uh, through a voltage between the inner and outer electrode. And so it's a simple calculation, but you will be amused to discover that radial part of the Laplacian minus one over R squared applied to U over R, which is one over R is zero. Okay, so then it means that E is zero. And so this should uh, tell you what uh, he meant in the title, freely flowing currents, meaning that you have a current without electric field in the bulk of the device. Now, it means that uh, if uh, field is constant, which is gradient of the potential, potential must be constant. Then it leads to a problem that we applied voltage from inner to outer electrode. And where do I put this potential and how do I match this thing? Um, and so there is no escape as to realize that there will be a discontinuous drop of this potential at the inner and outer electrode. So the potential in the pure hydrodynamic limit would be indeed constant. 
with the jumps uh, at the electrodes, and this is illustrated in this plot that he said. Now, what is the paradoxical situation here? The paradoxical situation is that it seems that viscous force, which is the left-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equation, does not affect the flow. Yet we have a dissipative coefficient, so energy is dissipated. You can check for yourself that the stress tensor is non-zero. It contains R, R, and phi five components. And again, we can, can calculate the dissipative, uh, dissipative component of the flow, okay? So, but again, here you just need to remember that this Laplacian comes from the divergence of the stress tensor and sort of in, in the words of Falkovich, uh, that even though we have no net force, divergence of the stress tensor uh, acting on any element of the fluid, there are non-zero forces acting on the fluid elements, displacing somehow this fluid element and creating dissipation in the flow. I don't have a very intuitive picture, but it does look like when you try to flow in a very viscous environment, you sort of need to change your shape to move around. And so this is how this flow occurs. And I will try to give yet another point of view, uh, exploring sort of a classical analog with the problem of a syringe when we try to push the liquid through a channel. So I'll, uh, when, when I'll present uh, uh, results for thermal resistance, I will mention this just in, in a second. All right, so I generalized this for the, uh, again, the entire density profile. Uh, it is more complicated than that. Uh, Grisha missed something. So he worked only in a high density limit. Now, if we go to charge neutrality, you need to, again, include the um, uh, effects of intrinsic conductivity and so on to so generalize the scheme. So what is changed is that it's not the electric field that is expelled. It's incorrect in general. It's there. It's force density that is expelled, uh, which is a linear combination of electric field and temperature gradient. It leads to a quite peculiar features. It means that if you drive the system only electrically, you necessarily develop temperature gradients in the flow. It's unavoidable. Uh, so we recalculated uh, all of the matrix of this uh, kinetic coefficients. Uh, the contributions to the dissipative power comes both from the stress tensor relative mode, we have an expression for the resistance and thermal resistance. So in resistance, this part, which is high density when N is large, recovers Falkovich result. When N is small, relative mode dominate, you get something else. Uh, and uh, we also get a thermal resistance, uh, which is also quite complicated. As you can see, these resistances are expressed through everything basically. So that's uh, the result, but I would like to tailor this analysis to charge neutrality. So in charge neutrality, Falkovich picture is, is gone. So resistance is just simply intrinsic conductivity. P here, P here is the aspect ratio of the Carbina disk. So R2 divided by R1. So this would be here only uh, uh, intrinsic conductivity because this uh, var sigma would be just uh, back to sigma itself. So let me try to derive a thermal resistance also at charge neutrality. So this term, with density would be gone. So we will only have a contribution for, from the viscosity. So the idea is the following. So from thermodynamics, we know that the jumps of temperature are related to density and local change in electrochemical potential, and then the change in temperature. And then uh, the only thing that we need to remember from the previous slide is that force density expulsion condition. If uh, we work at charge neutrality, N is zero, so this uh, part is gone, it means that the temperature gradient is zero, which means that the temperature in the fluid must be constant. Yet I apply temperature difference between inner and outer electrode and the situation is similar. It means there has to be a discontinuous jump of temperature. It is different from, you may think it's analogous to let's say a pizza resistance where also a temperature drops occur, but this case is quite different. The amount of the jump in this problem is controlled by the dissipation in the bulk of the flow, while the amount of the jump in the Kapitza problem is de defined by the property of the interface itself. Uh, all right, so then, uh, so then uh, we, we see that uh, the extra excess of pressure is related to the temperature jump. So let me abbreviate TL would be temperature in the fluid. And then force balance condition is, is matching this pressure excess by the radial component of the uh, viscous stresses acting on the fluid. And I need to write this equation twice in the inner electrode, in the outer electrode. So then it means that I can calculate by how much temperature drops uh, if I know how 
what my temperatures are in each of the electrodes. And if I take the difference of these two equations, I find the global temperature difference applied. It scales with the entropy current and the ratio of the two give me thermal resistance, which is this, uh, this part of the uh, equation. Uh, all right, so, um, so Weizmann group uh, led by Shahala line, actually they, they've done this measurement with this carbon nanotube technique. Uh, uh, again, this device has this Gurji-like effect in the resistance. And so they characterized uh, the carbina disk uh, first at low temperatures at 6, 14, so on Kelvins. These devices are not perfect. They're still, they're not in the perfect aerodynamic limit. So you don't expect to see these perfect sharp drops and so on. Uh, but basically what they've done is that from the high temperature data, they subtracted the measurement of the low temperatures to see how much of the hydrodynamic contribution remains. Uh, and they see that once you change temperature to a higher temperatures where a hydrodynamic uh, um, window should occur, you see the flattering of the measured electrochemical potential in the bulk of the flow. And so this was sort of uh, uh, an indication of this force expulsion uh, condition. And okay, that's uh, experiment away from Montrellis. Yeah, so that's part of the... No, as far as I know, no. So, and again, it's very, at neutrality, the most interesting thing will be thermal part. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, so this can be generalized uh, to uh, magnetic resistance. Uh, things get a bit more complicated, uh, but it can be worked out. Uh, so we've done this with York and uh, uh, looked at magnetic resistance in high density. So you get the viscous magnetic resistance. And I also recently looked at the charge neutrality regime and uh, sort of result is very similar, but the uh, technical origin is sort of quite different. Uh, it contains this intrinsic conductivity, but the rest is similar. So it scales inversely proportional to viscosity and uh, scales quadratically with magnetofield. So it's positive uh, quadratic magneto resistance. And uh, I calculated not only the resistances, but thermal and the entire matrix of thermoelectric uh, coefficients. Um, okay, so that's that. So let me see. Do you have like 10 more minutes? Five plus. Five plus. All right. At least maybe not everything, but I'll say a few words about the uh, electronic double layers. Uh, very big field with lots of very interesting things. Uh, so back in the day, uh, again, the Manchester group measured drug resistance. So when you have a bilayer separated by an insulator, you drive the current in one system and measure non-locally uh, induced voltage in the other system. So they measure drug resistance uh, in uh, double layer electron mono, uh, graphene monolayers. Uh, and uh, so this is what they saw. So first um, they saw, uh, so first of all, uh, because of the independent gate control, you have sort of four options. You can consider drug between electron, electron, whole, whole, electron, whole, whole electron, depending what you do. Uh, they found first of all that uh, it's non-symmetric. Uh, and secondly, they found, I, I think the most astonishing uh, observation is that when you go to the double charge neutrality, meaning that each layer is at charge neutrality, they found the finite drug resistance. Uh, so then if you are in the electron electron whole whole part, it starts to decrease, it changes sign, and then de it decreases and dies out at high densities. And if you are electron hole or hole electron, it goes up and, and so also dies at the higher densities. Uh, so then uh, they pick uh, the value of the uh, drug resistance edge charge neutrality has on itself quite complex temperature dependence in monotonic. It rises as a function of temperature and then dies out uh, at higher temperatures. All right. Um, so. Um, so the uh, pure momentum transfer, so usually we think about the drug is by transferring momentum from one layer to the other layer, but the charge neutrality, it's, this mechanism doesn't work because all of the transport goes through a relative mode and you could not drive the aerodynamic flow, it's impossible. So P, uh, momentum transfer mechanism is supposed to give zero drug resistance. So then uh, Leonid Levitov came up with energy drug. So I'll try to give a quick sketch of, you know, like combined picture. The P drug actually survives, uh, but it requires a bit more um, 
complicated ingredient. So we again need to recall that the system is uh, not homogeneous. And by the way, I need to say a crucially important nuance. If you read the paper, then somewhere deep uh, in the section which says anomalous drug neutrality, they say that we emphasize that the strongest peaks at the dual neutrality point were observed in the devices with the widest puddles regions, namely with the largest density variation. So we felt that this picture and the uh, model that we have with this long range disorder potential could be quite useful model to try to address this experiment. And so essentially this is what I did just to look at the two copies of these graphene devices. And because the uh, small spacing between them, I worked in the model when electrons in each layer see the same disorder potential, they become disorder correlated. So, so this becomes very, important in trying to incorporate both momentum and energy drug picture yes why, do you need a why well because they also had a separate data on the magneto drug i'm not discussing magneto or magneto hole it's sort of separate quite interesting but i'm just zero field uh, argument here all right so let me roughly speaking tell you about this mechanism of p drug and e drug uh, so the situation is the following. We learned with you in a single layer case that when I drive the system, even electrically, I necessarily develop temperature gradients. This temperature gradients would be transported to the other layer as well. So there will be induced temperature gradients in the other layer as well. So that would give uh, in the Levitov uh, terminology, a vertical heat flux from one layer to the other layer. Uh, and so this would be an E-drug e mechanism. And P-drug mechanism, because of the disorder correlations, is a usual uh, Coulomb-mediated electron-electron scattering intralayer. And so they can be incorporated, uh, incorporated together. So it, it gets uh, a little messy, but uh, maybe I'll just flash some results. So you could derive an expression for P-drug component uh, momentum mechanism of drug resistance it has a very similar form as the conductivity enhancement near charge neutrality that I've showed you earlier. It contains this correlator of uh, densities, uh, fluctuations in each of the layers, and it scales inversely proportional to fluid viscosity. It contains this drug coefficient that needs to be calculated. It's a little work to do this, but it, it's doable. It actually goes a little bit beyond of the pure hydronomic picture. You need to add the... Uh, you need to promote aerodynamics to include Langevin fluxes and to uh, work with that. Um, but okay. Uh, and then, um, there, as I said, there will be thermal in imbalance between these two sheets, and you can calculate uh, an interlayer near field effect. So, interlayer thermal conductivity, also due to Coulomb interactions, can be calculated and can be expressed again in terms of intrinsic conductivity in this fluid if we are interested only in the regime of charge neutrality. Uh, a similar expression exists for the energy drug, uh, energy component of drug resistance. Uh, the key part, it has an opposite sign. And so then when you promote this to a finite density results, the competition of these two mechanisms explain you the sign change and the monotonic dependence of the drug resistance. All right, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, my uh, collaborators. Uh, so it's my student who just recently arrived but had a very quick impact working on this drug problem. My postdoc Son Chili and my collaborators, Anton Maxim, uh, my experimental colleague at UW Medicine, Victor Brark uh, in York uh, here. And uh, we came to a most fun part. Uh, so I have a homework for you to enjoy. Uh, to those of you who don't know this, uh, Navier-Stox equation uh, is a fun problem to solve. It gives you some rewards. Uh, if you go to the uh, Clay Institute for Mathematics and the click on the link of Millennium Problems, uh, you will find the problem of the Navier-Stox equation. And they formulate say that although these equations were written down in the 19th century, our understanding of them remains minimal. And the challenge is to make a substantial progress towards a mathematical theory which would unlock the secrets of the Navier-Stokes equation. So I hope that I, I unlocked some secrets for you. It doesn't mean that you owe me a million bucks, but uh, uh, so to your amusement, I suggest you to read the official problem description. You can submit your solutions to archive uh, and then the prize will wait for you. Uh, all right, with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much. <coughs> Okay, thanks for this nice talk. I have time for questions.
And going back to your Corbino geometry, I was curious. So you, so you have the expulsion of force. What happens if you have a, a superconducting uh, uh, system and in a Corbino geometry? The I, I would be afraid that... to want to guess. I, I, well, I have no idea. No, we haven't even thought about it. <laughs> yes, another one. No. Uh, there are, are there other mechanisms which can give you D rho DT negative at low temperature? At low temperature? Like, yeah. Yeah, Kondo could be at low temperature, but again, you need magnetic disorder for that. What, what about Friedel oscillations? Well, if you, well, Friedel oscillations, this would be quantum uh, interference okay. corrections, if I'm sort of, but I don't think it gives. So yeah, you would get uh, correction to conductivity, which is linear in T tau or log of T into D in this other case. But again, it doesn't it doesn't give you this whole thing, right? And uh, again, these are low temperature effects, and we're talking about here, let's say in graphene case, hundreds of Kelvin. Thanks. So. <laughs> So thank you. I, I, you are working in in the in the laminar regime, right? In Correct. Your, yes. So how how do you define the Reynolds number in in this uh, picture? Well, it's similar estimates with viscosity in typical length scale. I think this is pretty small number, uh, given that the viscosity of graphene is pretty high as well. So I, I think that any of the nonlinearities that I neglect in the <clears throat> stocks, I think, is fully kosher. I, I think. Okay. <laughs> Alex, are there any uh, are there any restrictions uh, regarding the outer and inner radius uh, for the Corbino disk geometry? For instance, then you start to narrow the width of the Corbino ah, disk. Yeah. You can yeah, you yeah. can cross to the diffusive yeah. regime, for instance. Correct, correct. So basically, again, because of imperfections of these devices, you have R two minus R one, and again, you need to compare that to the Gurji lens. So then, of course, if you go too far, then you could be again going to the sort of a bump. Well, again, you still have these restrictions of the continuity, so some effects would still survive. Uh, experimentally, I know the aspect ratio. So there are, so in Shahal's experiment and Philip Kim experiment and Corey Dean's experiments that I know, aspect ratio is either three or five, and the sizes are about uh, a couple of micrometers. Other further questions? <laughs> Yes, I think that it's actually conceptual. So, are, are you saying that uh, this um, Andreev Spivak and yes. uh, Wilson thing this uh, longitudinal disorder? Yes. So they had one D. Well, no, they had two D. I just give an argument. No, no answer, but, but my question is it about actually is it your understanding of their work versus Gurji. So in Gurji, uh, I mean, uh, the, there is no any longitudinal disorder. There is that's just right. uh, that's the uh, different part of viscosity matters, right? That's right. So are you saying that basically this is the same thing and you'll get the same results or not? Because I mean, you somehow interchanged two things at some point. And, uh, uh, yeah, so I was saying that the part of the Gurji, which is viscous part, is quite analogous, but he missed all of this thermal conductivity component that is specific also to... Which, which basically, that's what was producing the resistance in, uh, in right. Andrea. So it looks like it's two different effects. Yeah, it's two different effects, and yeah. Okay, so then in two D, I, I just I completely miss. So in two D, I don't understand which which one is kind of leading, right? Because in two D you have some profile. Yes. Uh, so a naive view is that there are channels and there is lots of Gourget effects. Yes. And another maybe a bit more uh, exotic view is that okay, liquid has to go over the bumps. Correct. And it compresses and depresses, and that That's actually right. creates what. Uh, and right. Andrea, yes. uh, yes. Anton Andreev at yes. Alt head, That's right. Which I think is different from Gurji because it's, it's just sure. generation yes, of heat is. out of the non adiabaticity of uh, compression and depression of liquid. That's right. Yes. Right. So, so, so I just so, didn't, so, so ah. your results are, is it, I mean, if I put it blunt, okay. is it Gurji or is it no, Anton Andreev? It's Anton Andreev. Yes. Okay. So, why not Gurji? 
why not Gujim? No, uh, so let's say the example that I showed you for whole bar in the restrictive geometry, that would be a generalization, right? In in the clean case. Uh, right, but the... my point is that, okay, so, so somehow theory should know <laughs> which effect is leading or somehow so how to add them. And I didn't understand how you managed to consider the two effects together. No, I, I, not so that I, uh, in fact, I mean, I, I just, uh, the slide of Gurji was just a reminder about this Duro DT and so on, but okay. the, all of the calculations are extensions of uh, Spivak Andreev to the case of graphene with long range disorder. And this thermal effects are and crucially you important. That you can do it for 2D and there is no problem, is it? I, yes, it's mass, okay. but it's yeah, been right. done. Excellent. Final question. So is there some estimate for the variation in the density and yes. variation of RS in these systems? Is it in the sense in the low density regions, is RS coming close to the Wigner crystallization? Oh, no, no, no. Position? RS uh, for graphene devices, I don't know. RS is few. No, in, the, a... in the two decks that you were showing at the beginning. Yeah, two decks that are at the beginning, RS could be large. So is there any chance of Pomeranchuk like effects in those low density regions? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So thank you. Let's uh, thank the speaker again for the nice discussion. This also uh, concludes the morning session. So thanks to all the speaker and uh, see you this.